Well, okay, you guys. Um, it's Erica Lukes. I am here on UFO Classified. And I really apologize that the show has started late. And I want to say that I'm working behind the scenes with Jan Aldrich <laughs> to try to get him on the show. And so, you know, I'm telling you, it's never a dull moment in the world of technology. And earlier this week, I just need my cat to come sit on my lap. Um, earlier this week, my computer took a, a, a special, it had a special moment. And so the hard drive failed. And so it's in the shop. And so I've been working feverishly to try to, well, to try to get another computer that's older than the dinosaurs uh, in Vernal and try to make that work. And it's just, I'm telling you, oh my gosh, is my mic muted? It shouldn't be muted. I'm going to freaking cry now. Oh, balls of fire. Okay. All right, you guys. I need to... That's my hand sign language. Right. Okay. Oh, oh, the host can see you. The host can add you to the broadcast at the report. So my mic should be working. I'm not really quite sure what's happening. So you guys can't hear me. I swear, if I, I hope you guys are having adult beverages. So Mario, can you hear me? Hmm. Okay. Anyway, welcome to UFO Classified. I'm Erica Lukes. If you can't hear me, hopefully you can read my lips. But clearly, it's been a very exciting week on my end. Um, trying to get the computer fixed, doing some research, talking to. Oh, you can hear me, Simon, I love you. Thank you, you guys can hear me. And I wanted to say thank you um, for all that you do, uh, Mario um, and, and Shadowy Spectrums, you guys rock. So anyway, here is me being a complete kind of a, I don't know what, blithering uh, dingbat today. Um, but that's been, been the usual, I think. So I'd like to thank all of you for getting in and supporting my show and rolling with me with every technical challenge I have. And as you know, I clearly need to have somebody here to keep track of me, unmute my mic, and then actually get the audio to work. Oh, baby Joseph. Okay, hang on, guys. Is it, I'm telling you, I'm going on a vacation. Okay. Okay. So anyway, this is like a vaudeville act, but I would like to invite all of you to call into the show. Um, I can't get Jan on the phone or on StreamYard, but like I said, he's here and I know he's here in spirit. He's got a lot to talk about. And so hopefully, you know, we can get Jan in there and Jan, um, yeah, click the link, but I would really encourage any of you to call in to StreamYard and hopefully I could actually hear you guys. But if not, then I don't know. I'm going to find a, a large bottle of wine and, and, and probably lock myself in the closet later today. So I'm breathing. It's a very lovely thing. I am the master of slapstick, Amy. I'm just going to tell you, holy cow. So before I am, um, I just have to tell you this. So I got, before I went on um, the air, which actually I started a little bit late. Clearly I'm completely flustered. And I stepped on a stapler. Uh, and so I have a quite a large gash in my foot. And so it's, I'm, you know, it's been, yeah, we're, we're rolling with it. We're not rolling with it very well. But I would like to just say thanks, guys, for getting in here, making your comments. And I want to thank um, also, now that I'm calming myself down, I want to thank all the people that support my show from all over the world. It is really, really, really cool to know that I've got people in the UK. And I want to just thank all of you. And I can't wait to get some of you on the show and to know that I've got people up in Canada and down in South America. And it's just really for me being here and doing this show every Friday night, well, minus a couple as of late, is really, it, it, it's good for my soul. And I love the fact that everybody that listens to UFO Classified is so kind and thoughtful uh, with their comments and intelligent. And we really need more of that, I think, in this subject. I want to just say also, um, ooh, Jim, no way. Okay, okay, this is exciting. I'm going to go Jim to the show. What's up? Hopefully, I can actually hear you. 
Yeah. Dare to dream. I can hear and see you just fine. Well, I can't hear you, but Jim, oh, tell us. Really well? I I can't. Oh, good Lord, I can't. No, I can't. Oh my Lord, baby Jesus. Lord, Margaret, Mary, Mary, Holy Mother, Holy Mother, and all the babies. Um. Okay, so Jim, I know I can't hear you. <laughs> Jim? I know, I know. Okay, okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, sorry. Okay, so Jim, I can't hear you, but welcome to the show. And so I am going to breathe deeply. And then I want you to tell the listening audience, because I'm sure they can hear you, about yourself. And I know that you get in here and, and I love seeing you in chat. And it's really, it's just fun to have you call in. Thank you so much. So tell us, tell us the lowdown. Tell us about your UFO experiences, why you're here, why you like it. Um, okay, let me tell you one thing and it says the whole thing. Oh, sorry, Jim, go ahead. <laughs> How are you? Uh, I'm fine, thanks. Um, I'm on okay. the island. I'm on the island of Lewis. Go on back. Okay. Okay. You're not back soon. Okay, hang on, Jim. Just keep talking and I'm gonna mute my mic. Gremlins are at work. Let's see. That's a, it's a good thing. It's okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I don't know if you can hear me. Okay. I, I can hear you. Okay, Mario, darling, could you get, I, I know my, my mic isn't working. Actually, oh, that's, help me, baby Joseph. Okay, so Mario, okay, Jim, keep talking. Tell us about your UFO experiences. Tell us why you're here, and I know I said this before, but I am going to rely on Mario to give me, and the audience to give me information about what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, first UFO experience when a kid, 1957. whole bunch of us kids were out playing. It was uh, November. And one of the kids uh, drew our attention to this strange light that was just moving back and forth, back and forth. And uh, it wasn't a helicopter because we would have heard it. And of course, like everybody else has seen something strange, I got me started interested in UFOs. And eventually got a hold of some of uh, Major Donald Kehoe's books. And from there on, once I got older, could afford to buy a subscription to Flying Saucer Review. <laughs> a good old magazine, I miss it. And that's just kept my interest going ever since then. Um, I got the internet eventually in 1998. Uh, you find out that, that uh, who the real researchers are, Jan Aldrich, Barry Greenwood, uh, Mr. Gordon Law, uh, Paris mm -hmm. Flamont, who's long gone, there's quite a few. And so I just want to say, because I can hear you now, and thank you for humoring me, and I love you guys out there for hanging, but I, you know, you mentioned Gordon, and I just want to say that today I've been really, i kind of missing Gordon a lot, and so thank you for acknowledging him and, and talking about all the wonderful researchers, and I love your accent, by the way. <laughs> yeah, well, as I say, that um, I don't come... I'm from the mainland. I'm living on the island of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides. 
We were 50 miles from the Scottish mainland in the North Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> wow. and, it, and it's not as bad as you might think. But you are remote and you are isolated, so you have to back up everything food wise and uh, your drinking water supply as well in case that the electricity goes off. So uh, I don't think I could move back to the mainland again. It's pretty much like a lunatic asylum over there at the best of times. <laughs> Safer here, I think. I think that kind of sounds like Utah and you know, <laughs> now it's like the whole whole world is gone bonkers, but um and I'm a prime example of that clearly tonight. But but so I mean I so okay, tell me why, and I'm sorry if I missed this earlier, but clearly I was, you know, just doing my thing. Um, but why did you get involved with the UFO topic and what keeps your interest? Why do you keep hanging out and, and doing this? I ask myself this probably on a daily basis. Yeah, I know it's just a it's just a puzzle that you know but you're never going to unravel. I mean, it's, uh, you say you go down a rabbit hole. When you do that, you go into a rabbit warren. And then there's another rabbit holes that lead in the other rabbit warren. So um, you can be certain that everybody has actually had an experience and seen something in the sky that they couldn't determine as an aircraft that behaved strangely. Uh, that, that gets uh, that gets uh, their attention, or you just say, oh, well, it's just an aircraft or the government or something like that. But when you look at the uh, early reports, and as you know, Brad Sparks, uh, he's at over 1,600 that Jan Aldrich posted on Facebook for us. When you look at some of the reports in there, it's obvious uh, why, you know, the United States Air Force kept them secret. It's not just because of classified aircraft, it's because I, I think it, <laughs> they really didn't know what it was that they were up against, particularly with the Foo Fighters and the, the Second World War. And I love, I love reading about the Foo Fighters. You know, it's Keith Chester has done such remarkable work over the years, and I, I love you know learning from him, and and I just think it's fascinating. And I, again, you know, thank you for acknowledging Jan. I wish he was here. I know he's still, you know, there, but he <laughs> can't get in. But I mean, people like, you know, Jan and Barry, I mention this all the time. There's such, if we didn't have people like that in the world, then the history of this subject would be lost. And to me, you know, now we've got all these younger people entering the subject and much to my dismay, 99% of them, don't understand the the depth uh, mm -hmm. of the subject. They don't understand the history. They don't know who the people are who were involved. That really made uh, considerable, you know, ground for for all of us. And so, I think that's it's. I'm hoping through sh this show and um, a few other shows that we can actually educate a younger generation. So they're not just a, a new generation of YouTubers that you know get together and high five and yo bro and all of that stuff, I think there's, this is, we, we need to move forward and we can't move forward if we keep doing the same thing over and over again. So what, what do you think, when you look at the UFO topic right now, um, what do you think? And you guys get to see that, that's really awesome. But I mean, do you, do you think we're making strides? Do you think we're just repeating things over and over again? What are your thoughts? No, I don't think there's, in the United States, I don't think there's any progress we've made in the last 30 years, to tell you honest truth. When you look at all the nonsense that's come out, I remember buying Timothy Good's book, Above Top Secret, and, you know, I found it a bit hard to believe, and of course we now know that um, Mr Greenwood and others exposed it, showed how it was actually faked, how the signatures were superimposed and so on. And even despite this evidence being out there and being shown how it's done, you still get people who are supposed to be researchers that say, oh, no, it's genuine. The one fellow I spoke to, he said, no, that's genuine. This is well, the name uh, Forrestal is in there. I said, that's genuine. I said, but that's the only thing that's a bit genuine about it. I said, that's somebody that's, uh, it's misinformation that's getting fired, a, a distraction to take you away from some relevant topic deserves better scrutiny than it's getting. 
But as a standard of researchers, uh, it's going to become even more difficult now uh, with the cost of fuel and transportation and air flights and everything else for people who want to fly out and investigate something. It's going to be very difficult now unless they, they get uh, an, an organization that gives them funding. All right. All right. Um, and you know that's a really that's an excellent point and i actually haven't even thought about that you know there's so much happening in the world right now and you're you're right for the, the cost for researchers to to do anything and, and do what you need to do which is get out in the field and interview people and see their faces and and uh you know document um things that that will be incredibly difficult but i mean do you how many how many researchers do you think that there are now that actually get out from behind a computer screen and go to the National Archives or go sit in a community and videotape and interview witnesses and, and then follow up with those, those witness interviews. Do you think they're, I mean, I'm looking at the UFO, I guess the UFO circus um, in America and I don't see anybody actually, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys, I'm sure that there are a few people, but I don't really see people doing um, kind of boots on the ground work right now. No, it's, um, you're looking for people that's going to carry out research to the same standard as, as John Aldrich and Barry Greenwood and Mr. Law, um, Robert Todd, these kind of people where they didn't accept anything at uh, just face value. They studied it. I'll give you an example, Eric, and I've got to. Uh, Mr. Law's two books, The Mystery of the Skies, I came across uh, the incident that he he researched. I'd seen it on somebody else's website, but it wasn't in detail, and it didn't give uh, Mr. Law any credit for it. It was a USS supply incident in 1904 uh, off the coast of San Francisco, uh, when the watch crew saw three UFOs, they described them as meteors because there's no other terminology they could use, uh, appear over the horizon. Um, very large egg-shaped object with the, the pointed end going forward and the two smaller objects behind, but they're still large and orange. And they flew over the ship and over the horizon. And that was our Lieutenant Schofield, who was the captain of the USS Supply. And he went on to be the commander in chief of the US Pacific Fleet. And they all signed a sworn affidavit. But all of that information came from Gordon Law, who went and researched that and found it in, uh, in the archives. And that's the kind of standard of research that you've got then. But now I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. Now, UK researchers, obviously, I think Nick Redfern is the best. Uh, there may be others that I don't know of, but when someone who's a researcher and they bang the table and tell you the answer is that they're extraterrestrial, I tend to shun that kind of person and really not pay too much attention to them because it's, we've got no idea what they are. They could be, could be a combination of many things. But the thing is, that we don't need the government to come and tell us that they exist. We know they exist because we've seen them. What we want them to do is to tell us what they are. That's a tell. I don't think that's ever going to happen. You know what? I know, and it's it's it's. I mean, I, it's funny that people kind of rest their hats on disclosure, and and you know that's the big push. And I I, I get it, but I I don't because I think that like you you stated so brilliantly, you know, it's it's just a really difficult thing to ask. The, I mean, I don't I don't think they know. I don't think no, we've recovered don't. crashed flying saucers. Um, and I know that you get to see whatever is happening on my camera now, but I'll keep talking. But it's um, so it's it's very interesting. And I want to ask you really quickly, and I'm going to just put you on the, the big screen. You get the whole layout here, hopefully. Um, so what I mean, with UK research, like if talk about a little bit of the history of that that because to me right now I'm kind of shifting my focus and I'm I like I'm digging into the UK and all the sightings and the people involved and Jenny Randalls and some of the, the goings on you know back in the, the 70s and 80s it's fascinating yeah well that's um 
Bufora, the British UFO Research Organization, it was set up by the British Ministry of Defence and was funded by the Ministry of Defence. And it's probably since I've got an ar archive on the internet, it's probably still been paid for by the Ministry of Defence. So you people joining that thinking that uh, they sent their reports in and it was going to a research organisation when it was, it was going directly to the Ministry of Defence. And a lot of people, when they found out that they left, and there was troubles, I'm told, I don't know, it was only in before for a very short space of time. But um, there was trouble amongst the, the hierarchy about the use of hypnotic regression. I think Jenny Randalls was bitterly opposed to it, and Philip Mantell, he favoured it. And I don't know what the outcome was, but I know that uh, there was quite a lot of heated discussion over it, and several members left. But as I said, I'd already gone by that time, and I'm only getting information third hand. But before I was really not what it was supposed to be, that, that's the upshot of it all. They might have an archive of reports in it, but um, I would sooner rely on um, what Nick Redfern had uncovered and found as his research in UFOs. I know Nick's more he's interested in paranormal, but um, I would sooner go with that by anything that's in the before archive. And still one or two down south and in England, still one or two small groups. I'll get good reports and they keep them. But it's, um, it's the same in the UK as it is in the United States. You, know, you no longer have a bona fide uh, research organisation in the States now. I mean, uh, MUFON really should have the decency to roll over and die. Uh, you know, it really is really is pathetic. And, that that uh, just makes me happy. I mean, it's it's hard because, you know, I had Rob Soitek on uh, last week and, and things. And I mean, I really, you know, I, I really have a lot of respect for Rob. I like him. And there yeah. are good people in the organization. But like you said, it's, it's not effective. I mean, you, after 50 years, what have really at the end of the day, what is, has happened as a result of all of the information they've collected? Yeah, that's nothing. I mean, if, uh, yeah, I was listening last week and I've listened to uh, Phil Leach when you've had Phil Leach on. The way that um, Paul Anderson is his body set up, uh, before, it's solely as a business, Erica. That was how you make money. I think that's the main reason that uh, Cor Lorenzen you know, more or less put it them out of uh, APRO. Um, and solely to make money. And I think she recognised that that was, it was going from a research organisation to rely solely on money coming in from whatever. As it was a bad move. But it certainly needed, and it certainly needs to be. Uh, Mr. Spytek, he would be ideal to take over the run in a MUFON because he could know there'd be reliable people there. But at the end of the day, what are they going to do with the income that they're getting anyway from member subscriptions and whatever? It's, um, what are they going to do? I mean, it's a, what kind of research have they done recently? But people start talking about scientific research. I don't think that's going to be the answer because scientists tend to shun away from any, the paranormal or UFOs. And I mean, that's... Um, Look at QFOS, the amount of work and time that they put in uh, on the subject. And what did they find out? Well, we're back to square one, there's something there, but we don't know what it is. So I think it really is going to take researchers to pick something out. I mean, that's um, Pascal Gula, 1973, with, with Hicks and, and Parker. I'm against abduction. I never liked the, the abduction scenario, but I've got Hickson's book and Parker's book, and Hickson never wavered in his story. It was never embellished. He never added in to it. And where this incident took place was at uh, the Ingalls shipyard. 
owned by the Lytton Group now. Ingalls Shipyard built nuclear submarines, probably still do for the US Navy and anti-submarine warfare ships. And it's rumoured they also carried out work for the Hughes Company, Hughes Corporation. So it's kind of strange that the first thing that they see is a blue light. Now, interesting that they're using that as a weapon. And then a, a bright white light, you know, that the pulse that so many cycles a second could put you into a trans condition. But the thing that stands out the most is that both men tell you that they only felt pain when these creatures touched our arms. And to me, that's them being injected with something. I don't think it was a, an air pistol or an air rifle fired at them. But the whole thing is fabricated. Why? I have no idea. But 47 years later, after the event, when this gets looked at again, um, all these people come out after 47 years to tell you, oh, I saw lights and I was near there and I saw this and the next thing. And that coloured um, Parker, his story, because he met these people and, you know, he took in what they were saying and by his own admission, he fainted. So he wouldn't remember anything. And then he underwent uh, hypnotic regression with Lewis <laughs> Mud Hopkins. And I've got his, I've read his account and, you know, it's, it doesn't make any sense at all. What he's talking is uh, to be some sort of kind of space game, you know, Xbox game, something like that. It's, it doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense at all, especially when he's uh, reported to the police. The police say they were... Uh, both men were scared. He says you, you cannot fake fear. So you've got you've got these kind of things. Somebody get in there and look at Pascagoula again, and then actually come out with a better um, research, a better outcome to it. At the end of the day, it'll probably just be another brick wall. You can only go so far, and that's it. But the military are behind an awful lot of these abductions. Why? I've got no idea. But when you look at it since day one, Erica, it's uh, the intelligence, US intelligence community and others have been uh, pounding this extraterrestrial hypothesis since day one, ostensibly from the start through Major Donald Keogh and then through Dewey Furney and the Durant report or the Robertson panel as we know ours. He broached the subject he thought they were extraterrestrial in origin. Uh, many years later, oh, he said, we only said that because of our flying classified aircraft at the time to distract. I don't know. But uh, we need researchers of the caliber of the men that we've still got, men and women that are still there. Uh, when you look at the Isabel Davis, uh, yes. and Rafael, um, you've got to take over for them, by the way. You've got to take up the cudgel. And uh, exact and meticulous. They didn't make any assumptions. They didn't leave uh, their impression on I think this is what it is or that. It's, they, they gave you the information that they had the way it was given to them. And that's what's lacking now. I mean, but I mean why should we worry? Because you've got Mr. Jeremy Corbell as a. Uh, you know, he's well in with the Imperial Cuspanian Space Fleet or whatever it is. <laughs> so so we, we're safe when the invasion starts. <laughs> well, and I mean, he's living large. He's got his beautiful, you know, new estate and, and things, which is great. I know he actually does work, but I it is it is interesting to watch some of these figures that, that come out of, you know, I mean, that just every once in a while, well, not every once in a while, unfortunately, all the time, kind of pop up and then, oh, we have got this leaked document. And I mean, it's like, I guess, I guess George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell are the only people that get leaked documents. I mean, it's just, it's, it's fascinating to see. And I, sometimes I just wish I could come over to the UK because I think things are a little bit more functional over there. But, and I want to just acknowledge API, uh, Case Files, who was in chat, and I'm really glad that you're going to do boots on the ground uh, research. That's that's awesome, and I you can 
you know, think of a better person to do it with than Scott. So that is awesome. And I miss Scott. I was thinking about him today and I wish he was on the show. And oh my gosh, I think we might have Jan. Okay. So you, so Jim, stay on because we're going to add okay. Jan. This is the seventh sign of the apocalypse right here. Jan, you got it. Can you hear us? You look good if you can hear us. And I like your car. That's awesome. <laughs> we've, we've got the live action cam. So this, you, between Jan and I, we should have a production company. Like seriously, we could do some good things. Um, or at least entertain people. So, <laughs> okay, Jen, we're, you're, you're there. Can you hear us? So can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you, Jan. I don't think Erica can. Yeah, I'm not getting your your audio. <clears throat> Everyone can see and hear you. Okay. Well, apparently we're still having technical difficulties, but uh, I think I've got the camera and the mic working. Apparently the audio does not work. Yeah, well, your audio is working, Jan, but uh, your camera, I don't see any picture. Tell us why you're here, and I know I said this before, but I am going to rely on Mario to give me, and the audience, to give me information about what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, first UFO experience when a kid, 1957. A whole bunch of us kids were out playing. It was uh, November. And one of the kids uh, drew our attention to this strange light that was just moving back and forth back and forth, and uh, it wasn't a helicopter, because we would have heard it, and of course, like everybody else has seen something strange, I got we started interested in UFOs, and eventually got a hold of some of uh, Major Donald Kehoe's books, and from there on, once I got older, I could afford to buy a subscription to Flying Saucer Review. <laughs> A good old magazine, I miss it. And that's just kept my interest going ever since then. Um, I got the internet okay. eventually. Jim, can you hear me by chance? 98. I can hear you now, Erica. Okay, uh, perfect. Okay. So we're going to watch uh, excellent you, manual functions over here while I ask an you and this and just. So can you elaborate? And because Peter wanted to know a little bit more about your sighting uh, and some details, a little more detailed information. And so I just want to say, because I can hear you now, and thank you for humoring me, and I love you guys out there for hanging, but I, you know, you mentioned Gordon, and I just want to say that today I've been really I'm kind of missing Gordon a lot, and so thank you for acknowledging him and, and talking about all the wonderful researchers, and I love your accents, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... So I yeah, am hearing, um, I'm hearing the beginning of the interview. Um, you guys, I love you. And I just want to say, all of you who are in chat and things, just thank you for humoring me and my technical difficulties and things. And it's such a pleasure to have Jim on the show and actually talk to us. I wish we could get Jan on the show. Um, and we saw his car, so this is good, but we will figure it out. And this ought to be good for the memory books. And so, Jim, um, talk, talk yeah, like about it. Yeah, like you said, I don't think I could move back to the mainland again. It's pretty much like a lunatic asylum over there at the best of times. <laughs> Safer here, I think. I think that kind of sounds like Utah. And, you know, <laughs> now it's like the whole whole world has gone 
bonkers, but, um, and I'm a prime example of that clearly tonight, but so, I mean, I, so, okay, tell me why, and I'm sorry if I missed this earlier, but clearly I was, you know, just doing my thing. Um, but why did you get involved with the UFO topic and what keeps your interest? Why do you keep hanging out and, and doing this? I asked myself this. Okay, I don't know what's happening, but we can hear the audio from yeah, earlier in the show. It's just a, it's just a puzzle that you know that you're never going to unravel. Um, okay, maybe. Okay, if you can hear me, could you wave? You do that, you're going to unravel it more. Okay, I, I can't get your audio. Long, so. And I'm uh, sorry for stepping on Jim all the time. <laughs> no problem. I actually had an experience and seen something in the sky. So, Jan, if, okay, you can't hear us, but. It's crazy. If okay. it's all right, I okay. could uh, yes, um, discuss something with you. Yes. When you look at the area reports. Okay. Um, as you know. One thing is, uh, I sent out uh, 10 of UFO and government books to uh, congressional people, the uh, um, DOD, DOD, IG, um, NASA, and several other government agencies oh, yeah, I love, I love reading about just the before the report it's, came out it's Chester has done such remarks so in January I got a call I haven't told anybody but Greenwood and a couple others I got a call from uh, DOD now the uh, the fellow wanted to know if I could I, one of the things I included with the uh, with the book and my letter was uh a listing of U.S. government investigations and significant uh, events in UFO history. At the time, it was 107, but now it's about up to 137. Anyways, he had that list, and he asked me, is it all right if I distribute that uh, to government agencies. And I said, fine. I said, are you, uh, do you have the book? And he said, no, somebody took it from it, from, uh, from the letter and the, uh, the, uh, significant event, uh, list. And, I said, well, uh, who is going to, who is it going to be distributed to? And he told me, I don't know. My uh, assignment was to get your permission to distribute it. They don't, they haven't told me who they're going to distribute it to. So uh, I said, fine, distribute it. Um, and he, like I said, he didn't know anything. He was just told to call me. And I asked him about the list and if he knew anything about it. And he said, no. He said, all this is Greek to me. He said, I don't know anything about UFOs. I was just told to call you and get your permission. So that's where that stands. So can you, and you probably can't hear me, but can you elaborate since you can't hear me okay no i can't see you guys i will just say i love my audience thank you for for joining me through this and jan and jim and i also want to just say jan um and greetings from belfast scott thank you it's nice to to have you in chat and Amy and Dinah and the whole gang, uh, Simon. So thank you guys for, for being here and thank you for being supportive of the show in whatever form, slapstick, actual, you know, serious conversation, things like that. It's, um, I really do love doing this. And, and Jan, I wish we could ask you some more questions and Jim left, but 
so anyway, and I know if anybody else wants to jump in, Jen, can you talk? I mean, oh, baby, can you see me? No, you can't see me. Good. Balls of fire. Balls of fire. Balls of fury. I don't even know what to say. But you look good, Jan. Especially the steering wheel. That's very cool. I would love to know where you're sitting, but you can't hear me. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, while I fix my camera and while we watch this incredible endeavor of the inside of Jan's car, which is fascinating, I would really hate for you guys to see the inside of my car. Lori. And hi, uh, Angel's Rifle. Thank you. This is good. And Jan is, is back in. He's in chat twice or in, in the stream yard twice. So um, hopefully you guys can hear me. I don't know. Maybe not. Smoke signals. Yes, this would be good. Hang on, guys. Okay. Yes. Hopefully you can hear me now. All right. This is where my bre deep breathing techniques and, and my yoga and meditation come into play because clearly that is, um, yeah, not working for me. So Jan, anything in, hey, alien scientist, nice to see you guys here. So um, Jan, any thoughts? Great. This is good. Um, <laughs> anyway, on this, on this note, I want to just mention that Jan Aldrich, um, has, has been, so if, if you'd yeah. like me to talk, would you just wave at me? Okay. So one of the things we were going to talk about, and I'm sorry, I can't hear you guys is um, uh, and this was in the, uh, this was one of the items on the list, but, um, because we don't do UFO history anymore, or there's a significant amount of people that don't think UFO history is important anymore, uh, they're missing a lot. And one of the things that's missing is called service C I R B I S communications instructions for reporting vital intelligence um, this grew out of an older um, uh, reporting format in the Second World War. Um, it did not report Foo Fighters or anything like that. It reported normal enemy activity. It was an emergency, emergency type of thing. Uh, after the war, the person that invented it suggested that it be a uh, um, transition to peacetime and there was a big argument about whether it should or not and the final finally in 1951 it was transitioned to peacetime and it was called service like i said before now not to go through a whole bunch of rigmarole um in 1951 messages started flowing through the uh through the service system and UFOs was part, one of the items that was supposed to be reported. Some of these got the blue book. Some of them didn't. In 1956, 
Canada joined. And they were part of the service system, and it went to the Air Defense Command and later to NORAD. Blue Book ended 1970. The messages in the service system continued to go somewhere. Uh, we know now that they went to uh, uh, NORAD. Uh, whenever the Air Force was asked about it, they said we don't can we don't uh, we don't have files. Um, so after asking him over and over again, um, Andruffel wrote to the Secretary of Defense, and she got an answer from an Air Force spokesman that said. Oh, yes, we have those. Um, it takes many agencies to come in and declassify them. So uh, uh, we can't give them out, though. Now, we know the system is still in effect today. From 51 to today, it is still in effect. And how do we know this? Because the Canadians do not classify service reports. And they send them to Chris Rakowski after they're through with them. And he has been getting him up to the current time. So this is a system that continues to report UFOs from 51 to now. That's very significant. However, if you're not interested in history... It doesn't mean much. And uh, when when this stuff is brought before Congress, they aren't aware of this. It's not in the report anywhere that they gave to Congress. So we're still hiding what's going on officially with UFOs. Thanks. So can you keep going, Jim? Tell us a little bit more. Um, okay, so um, Jim, how about you? What do, I mean, what do you? Does, does a pot move? And I think what Jim, I can we can hear the relay of the audio from earlier for some uh, reason. That's why I take. He would die. Yeah, we take over the run and I'm using free plan. Because he oh, was dear. reliable people there. <laughs> but then the day, what are they going to do with the income? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. okay. Whatever anyway, okay. So, Jan, um, I mean, it's if you can, recently. nobody knows what's that happening that right now. I don't, it's but um, I don't I'll that's tell you, this has been this is exciting so far. So, um, write Jan some keywords. So, eh, I mean, so Jim, okay, just, just talk while I go hide in a corner, a very dark corner with margaritas. I'm switching to margaritas. This is my imaginary Friday evening. I'm going from wine to margaritas. It's going to take researchers to pick something up. I mean, that's um, Pascal Kula, 1973, with Hicks and, and Parker. <clears throat> So I will say, and, and thank you so much, you guys, for, um, and I know you guys are speaking in a foreign language in chat, and I would love to know what you're saying. I have a feeling it's quite naughty. But yes, uh, UFOs and Government uh, is really an excellent book, and I picked that up again today. And I wish that um, we could, Jan could hear us, because I would love to ask him a little bit more about some of the people that he worked with on that book. It is just exceptional. I know Richard Thiem. Uh, of course, Barry Greenwood. Uh, it, it's just wonderful. But Jan um, and Jim, can you? I don't know if you can mute the, this. Oh, actually, thank you. I, I can still hear the playback. Yes. But Jim, what do you think it's about? Like, I mean, give us a little more information about the work that all of the, the you know Robert Powell and everybody and did on the next book. Play. You know, that's a post. I'm losing you in amongst that replay, Erica. 
So um, can you turn off the the sound? I mean, well, with the replay, that's really strange that it's, well, it's really not strange. In all actuality. Let's see if I can. I don't think it was a, an air pistol or an air I don't think I can mute the microphone. But the whole thing is fabricated. Why? I have no idea. Let's see, I'm trying but to mute the mic. 47 years later, after the event, when this gets looked at again, I'll uh, switch the camera off. Come out after 47 this is, years. It doesn't get much more live than this. Really raw. Mm -hmm. this and the next thing. And that coloured. Um, no, yeah. sorry. Um, oh, that's okay. That's okay. It's, I mean, and, and so tell it. I mean, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. I guess you can't hear us, but um, and he, I don't think he can read the private chat. But Jim, you got the that to work. So can you just you know, like I said, just just talk about some of the work that. Robert uh, Powell and Mike Swords, who I would love, love, love. Speaking of Mike Swords, I was thinking about him earlier, and I would absolutely love to have the opportunity to speak with him. He's one person over the years I haven't spoken with, and he has got such a vast knowledge of things. Have you ever, have you spoken with Mike Swords over the years? Oh my baby Joseph. Okay. Help me. Anyway, okay. Jen, if you could keep talking. Okay, so that's uh, that's basically uh, the two items I had for news. Uh, we continue to uh, scan UFO reports for KUFOS. Um, I I sent. Uh, Dave Waller in New Mexico, who has the Kufos uh, sighting files, I've sent him uh, more than 40 boxes so far, and I believe about a thousand case files, but it may not be that many. I've also sent him uh, various items dealing with UFO history or you know, the history of, say, um, ATIC and FTD and uh, regulations and things like that. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Dorder, uh, also known as Oregon Otto, I sent him, uh, I sent uh, David the, uh, the, uh, compilations that Dr. Dorder made on uh, Firewatch uh, observers that had UFO sightings. Um, and I've, I always, uh, a, a, when I, when I see one of these reports in the files that I'm scanning, I always make a note of it in the title. So that, that kind of thing C1, C2, C3s, um, radar visuals, aircraft sightings, um, uh, this last year, I went to the University of Wyoming, so, um, Dr., uh, Dr. Haynes, Richard Haynes' material on aircraft sightings is at the University of Wyoming. His other UFO material is at Rice University. I, I did get a chance to look at a couple of boxes at Wyoming and copy some of the aircraft cases that are not well known. 
Um, I hope to get down to Rice this year and back up to Wyoming and look at all of the aircraft cases in Dr. Haynes's papers. So I'm going to stop now and let other people talk. I mean, okay, Jim. Um, Jen, really, you should keep talking. Uh, yes, Jen. And Dimensional Babe Heights, nice to see you, and API Case Files, and Muscle Hynek, and, and Scott's, and everybody, again, thank you for humoring me and having this fun journey with technology and and bad behavior and things. So anyway, Jan, um, do you, um, Jim, Jan, anybody? Jim, what have you got for us? <laughs> Jan has very, very nice hands. I don't even know what to say. Okay, so Jan, if you could keep talking. Okay, um, Jim, anything? Oh, mother of Lord, have mercy. UFO historian, majestic Q Clarence. Yes, we know it's kind of just one of those things. So um, yeah, Jan, um, I don't know if you can hear me. God is punishing Erica today. Yes, God is punishing me today. But um, that's okay. That seems to be the way we roll with it. <laughs> and definitely this is going to be a show that you might never see again because I might this might just not make it to YouTube. I mean, it's on YouTube, but we might have to delete this after YouTube. So, and yes, just reset. Gremlins, I know, we're gremlins in again, I'm telling you. Okay, Jan. Walls of fire again. Okay, Jen. Okay, I don't even know what to say, but anyway, thank you, um, Gobstoppa, Gremlins. Gremlins and God unleashing his nasty wrath upon me because clearly I have not bathed in holy water enough this week or something to that effect. But anyway, we're waiting for Jan to continue his dialogue because there's so many questions I'd like to ask him, but we'll just do, we'll get, you know, get what we can. I want to thank all of you again for being here and supporting UFO Classified. I want to, um, Thank all of my Patreons for supporting the show and also people who get in and, and do the super chat um, and and help with archiving and things. I'm really excited. I'm hoping that Jan and Barry can make it out to Utah to look at the wonderful archive that I have here. It's just such, as I talk about on every show, it is amazing to see the, the, the scale, the depth that, that Anne Ruffle went to and others that have, have contributed to my archive here. And I want to, uh, Jan was mentioning Dave Marler, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for Dave. He has done incredible work. I hope to get him on the show sometime soon, but hearing, um, you know, after, after Barry and Jan's trip to Dave Marler's, hearing the wonderful things that he is, is doing and the really slick operation that he's got going on that is really gives, that should give all of us hope for um, continuing historical preservation, which is so important. And I, um, yeah, I don't think Jan's monitoring chat either, but Jan, can you see me? Okay, okay I'm gonna uh, stop talking and let oh. uh, you and Jim carry the rest of it. No, I, no. you know, I, uh, no, keep talking. I can't hear anything. Uh, and uh, one, solving one technical difficulty leads to another, I guess. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Keep talking. Keep talking. Oh, balls. 
Clearly that's my favorite word. Okay, anyway. Uh, you can't even see that. That's us keep talking. Oh, mother of hellfire. You can't even see that. Jam. Oh, Jim. Okay, anyway. Uh, that doesn't seem to have much resolution. I can't read it. That's... Okay. All right. Okay, anyway. Yeah, hang on. Oh my God. Well, oh, yep. Keep talking. <laughs> That's an invitation you should never give me. Well, girls gotta do what a girl's gotta do. So, um, well, of course, one of the things that uh, people may know is that Mil Philip Mantle is uh, boxing up his material and sending it to uh, Kufos, and it'll be integrated in the Kufos files. And that's more or less what I'm doing also. Uh, I have Andy Roberts' uh, Foo Fighter material, and I have his um, case file reports and uh, a lot of his correspondence. Um, so we have that. We have Dr. Willie Smith, who's... Um, uh, who is a Uruguayan, but he lived, you know, he lived in the United States and taught in um, Michigan. And we have his files, about a thousand cases from what, what he called the Unicat. And they were um, uh, analyzed. And he had a very... Uh, well, actually, Heineck is the one that analyzed them, and he just told Willie, "I want these cases in this, uh, in like this super file." And uh, Willie also had what he called a maybe cat, which was a number of cases that uh, weren't good enough to get in the Unicat, but. Uh, Willie said maybe more information will come in, or uh, he had two or three people from Kufos who would investigate these cases every once in a while. So uh, some would be able to cross over to the Unicat. The, 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 there were high standards for the Unicat, in other words. Um, I've got some of Lauren Gross's files. We used to exchange things back and forth. Um, and uh, if you know anything about uh, uh, the UFO history series or the fifth uh, uh, horseman of the apocalypse, which uh, is also names of his booklet, he did about uh, 42 booklets. And uh, I have on my site, if you want to look at, some of the more modern cases, his uh, his thing went from pre forty seven up to nineteen um, nineteen sixty three. Uh, so, but on my site, I have a number of other cases that he commented on, um, and, and it's on Project One Nine Four Seven. Uh, dot com www project one nine four seven dot com so uh, that's 
that's some more Lauren Gross stuff there, and that's a comment on more contemporary cases. Um, I have uh, the uh, cases from uh, NICAP, Connecticut. Um, I have cases that people all over the country have sent me to go into the scanning project. <laughs> you know, sometimes one or two or that they thought were very interesting that should be in the scanning project, sometimes 30, sometimes 100. Uh, and I've been collecting since uh, 19... I got my first government document in uh, 1959. It was about the ghost rockets, and it was from the government of Sweden. Um, and it was something called News from Sweden. It was a, a commentary on the ghost rockets. So that's my first government document. Um, as far as... Um, a, a number of the other people that have uh, uh, sent us stuff. Uh, the NICAP uh, cassettes and tape files, uh, Rod Dyke ended up with those because he bought uh, Richard Hall's collection. Richard Hall took all the, uh, um, the taped witness statements and other things like that home. So those were um, were not in the NICAP files. So th those have been reunited with the NICAP files now. So they're in with the paper files. They've been uh, put in with them. Uh, let's talk about Ann Druffel again. Um, there's a lot of unsorted material that went to David. Now, we went through and sorted some of it, but he's got two filing cabinets still that need to be sorted. I was looking through those filing cabinets, and it says uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base uh, UFO log. And I've been looking at it for this forever. There was, a, there was a, a story about it in the UFO investigator for NICAP. But this is something that Ann Truffle got from one of the guys, one of the, the person that was supposed to investigate the Vandenberg sightings um, in 67, 68. And it's a log of sightings that he investigated. And so I, I, I told Dave, hey, this is, I've been looking for this for a couple of decades. So somebody must have took it out of the files and put it into this and sorted things. And he says, oh, wait a minute. I've got a tape file. And it's an interception from Vandenberg. Um, the radar station is talking to the fighters that are up there looking for the UFOs. And Dave says, oh, this is great. And he says, uh, that's what's in your log. Well, that's what's in the log, right? And I said, no, no. That's just one thing in the log. That's just one sighting. This is sightings over about 14, 15 months. And he says, oh, oh, so there's a lot. And uh, and Druffle got that. And like I said, somebody must have pulled it out of the files and then just put it into a uh, a bunch of unsorted uh, uh, files. And uh, so that came to light again. Um, and I, I, uh, what I love to do now that I'm bringing everything out of my own collection and the other collections that I have here, and I have a, uh, collections from, from a, a number of other people, like I said, Plus, all the research I did, I went to uh, uh, 46 states and Canadian provinces and went to the legislative libraries and 
and other places and historical societies, about 150 archives altogether, plus what's ever at Washington, D.C. So now this stuff is being all gathered together and scanned. And as I scan it, I send it to David so he can insert it in with the paper files. And we hope maybe next year we will have all the KUFOS files scanned. The goal is to put them online for free. Dan, if you can see this, tell us more. <laughs> We've got it question about the Battle of LA. I don't even know what to say. Well, yes, you're definitely buying a Hyundai after this. Cue cards, Jen. Um, <laughs> so it, it this, um, the archiving, <laughs> Well, I, I, I think you're asking about the Battle of L.A. Um, I did my own research on that. Um, and then somebody on the West Coast told me that they wanted to research it. And so I gave him uh, a, uh, some uh, leads and everything, and he followed up on him. And after about six months, he wrote me, he said, this, this story goes on forever. He said, I keep finding things and I keep talking to people and they keep telling me things. And he says, it's hard to check into them now that it's, well, that was in the, in the eighties when he was doing this. He says, it's hard to check into these things because it, they're so long ago. But he said, this thing will go on and on and on. And uh, David Mahler's, he's a, he has some of the actual newspapers in which the, um, the searchlights are searching for things. Um, so there's one, one thing that's an IFO, it's a balloon. It's the artillery, the anti-aircraft artillery, they use meteorological corrections so a balloon was sent up and that was one of the things that was seen and you know the unfortunately the guns fired on that but there's other things where people were seeing six or seven lights in the sky Moving up and down the, the uh, Central Valley there, uh, there were some people reported a dirigible-shaped object. It's just It just goes on and on and on. And uh, like I said, David uses this in one of his presentations when he does his uh, talks on uh, triangular UFOs, it's its one of the things he talks about. Uh, he, uh, uh, like I said, it's one of those things that uh, it's not all resolved yet. We have the uh, some of the official documents, but not all of them. Uh, we need people at the archives every day. Keep talking. <laughs> okay, keep talking. <laughs> so uh, Dave's going out to the Ozark conference and he has an updated uh, triangular presentation 
Now, Dave Clark in England, Dr. Dave Clark said, well, this comes from Star Wars. It's the, uh, it's the Imperial uh, ships is from the Star Wars movie in 1977. These triangular things. Of course, those triangular things are going with the sharp end of the triangle forward. A lot of these cases, the blunt end is going is is forward. Not all of them. I mean, they, and and they have this thing where they seem to stop and turn, and then. Uh, <coughs> accelerate away and they go all the way back to 1947 so it's not a new modern military thing that came about in 77 although since the 70s these things have uh, the triangular UFOs have exploded there's not as many in the old old thing old uh cases. There are some. Now he found 150, but every time I start scanning, I find uh, you know, triangular cases. So on the uh, on the file folder, I, I draw a big triangle so that, that that gives him the clue that he should look at that. Um, uh, cases involving um, uh, medical or injuries to people. Uh, a lot of it's uh, sunburn. Uh, a lot of these UFOs blind people and maybe not just for an instant, but they blind them for uh, uh four or five days maybe and their eyesight's coming back slowly. Um, skin irritations. Um, uh, a lot of other things. Uh, interference with the uh, uh, with a woman's period. Um, uh, sometimes hearing. Not very much, but a lot of times people feel heat and uh, wind, you know, like there's coming out of the UFO, like there's uh, wind. Um, and sometimes a warm breeze from the UFO, so it's, it's both. Or sometimes it's just heat being close to the UFO. It gets really hot. Um, and a few times cold, like you open a refrigerator door. So there's a there's a lot of those type of cases, a lot more than I ever thought there were. Let's put it that way. When Dick Hall wrote the UFO evidence, he was unconvinced about these cases, and he talked to a Mrs. Coon, who had a sighting in 1947, uh, who Carl Lorenzen also looked into Mrs. Coon's sighting, and. Well, both were convinced that uh, there was something to this, and Paul interv uh, interviewed her, her over the phone, and he said, she convinced me that uh, physiological uh, sightings with physiological effects were true. He said, so that was right before I wrote the UFO evidence, so then I put these other cases of of, of uh, physiological effects in the UFO evidence. He said, before that, I was skeptical of them. But when I talked to her, she was very convincing. And uh, so that was that. Was that. And of course, there's physical cases. Um, UFOs hitting things, uh, causing... Uh, tree branches and uh, grass and uh, brush to uh, 
move back and forth under the UFO. Um, in some cases, uh, in Minnesota, uh, one UFO hit the de uh, deputy's car, and they still have that car uh, at a museum in Minnesota. You can go and see it. And it re wrecked the car. Now that was that. That's an interesting case. Uh, Van Johnson. Van Johnson. That's the uh, witness's name. He was a policeman. Um. So these are these are all very interesting. And then, of course, in Canada, Mechelec. Now he, it was like he got a real bad dose of uh radiation. And he was he was in the hospital. Um, and one thing they said when, like, the son and his relatives, they went to visit him, and his body was given off a horrendous odor. Uh, and he died. And the uh, the Condon committee uh, didn't make they didn't cover themselves in glory uh, investigating that case. Um. And Chris Rakowski's uh, got so much documentation on that. It, it's amazing. But Willie Smith had, had it. And, of course, Kufos and Nightcap had in their files. They all had it. So the idea is put everything together and see what we have. Uh, some people have items that others don't. And we've done that with a number of sites. Um, Arizona. Okay, Blue Book says the case happened in Cochise, New Mexico. There's no such thing as Cochise, New Mexico. And so we've got the Blue Book file. But then we have the file <clears throat> from the 4602nd Air Intelligence Service Squadron, which investigated, was the field element that went out and investigated these cases. So, um, the, uh, the case was uh, very interesting. The 4602nd said it occurred in um, Cochise, Arizona, which is correct. And it said there was radio interference uh, from several stations that the pilot this is a military case, so the military pilot's calling these different bases, and he noticed that he was having interference on his radio, and that was not in the Blue Book files. So putting these, putting this uh, Blue Book and 4602nd together, and you have an unknown case, and it wasn't a balloon, because it's, it's the typical UFO case where it's doing stuff that's, you know, supposedly physically uh, can't be done. Aerodynamically, it can't be done. Um, the, uh, there's more like that. Uh, there's one at Castle Air Force Base. It's called the pop-up UFO. Uh, people were calling the... Uh, Air Force Base, Castle Air Force Base, and uh, they were saying, hey, there's something up there. And uh, Castle looked on their radar and they couldn't get anything. But there were two fighters up there, two F-86s. So the, uh, uh, the radar uh, station on the phone with some of the uh, witnesses on the ground and they vectored the uh, um, the, uh, the jets to the UFO. So as they're coming at them, the UFO goes up in the clouds. So one pilot says, I'll take the, I'll, I'll go to the uh, to you know, to the over top of the clouds, and you stay here below. So he went up, 
And here's the UFO where it popped out of the clouds when he's up there. So he starts heading towards the UFO, goes back in the clouds. And it pops up or pops down to the aircraft waiting at the cloud deck. And so he goes after it. And it continues to do that kind of thing. People on the ground are all witnessing this. So the case in Blue Book is not complete. In the meantime, uh, Dr. McDonald at the University of Arizona talked to the, to the pilots, talked to one of the pilots, and he drew him some diagrams and everything. And so McDonald had the name. So when Lauren, uh, I went to the archives and I copied a lot of the 4602nd UFO cases. And Rod Dyke um, copied them and sent to Lauren and Barry and uh, himself copies of the cases, the 4602nd copy. So Lauren, he lays everything out on his living room floor and he noticed McDonald had the guy's name, but in the 4602nd files, they don't redact the name. So he says, hey, wait a minute, this is McDonald's interview. The, the pilot gave uh, McDonald the wrong date. The date is in 56. So by putting the blue book McDonald interview and the 4602nd, we have a, a, a very or we have a more complete um, version of what happened in that case. And it's no longer a balloon, again, like the Air Force thought. It's something apparently intelligently reacting to these spiders. Yeah. Well, you know, just had to ask that one. That's what I want to know. <laughs> That's what I want to know. I mean, here, here's what. I don't think in my lifetime I'm going to find uh, the absolute evidence that it's E.T. Um, that may be, may be the answer or it may be something else. It's definitely something that's not mundane. That's what I would say. And, uh, I would like to see better evidence. Um, and I hope that happens before I, I leave the, uh, the earth here. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yes, this is... Again, very interesting. It's been an interesting evening. I really um, love you guys. I want to thank Scott. For this is technical me. difficulties again. Oh, my Lord. Um, I can barely hear you, and I can't get the volume to go up. Keep talking. <laughs> okay. So, uh, one of the famous cases in England is called... Um, Topcliffe. So this is during, or right after, let's put it that way, the main brace sightings in September of 52. Um, there's a pilot out there uh, with a fighter, and this UFO comes by, and he's trailing him. The UFO is trailing the the fighter pilot, he performs a series of maneuvers, which is in one of the York, York here newspapers that Lauren Gross. Well, I sent it, I sent him the the uh, diagram, but anyways, Lauren Gross used it in his book. So, uh, uh, it was all over England, um, and. 
they, they, it was also observed from the ground by a number of airmen. Um, and their pictures are in a number of newspapers, as is, I think, the pilots in one of the pictures, too. Um, and it's described vividly in the clippings. And Heineck went over there about 56. And he went to the Air Ministry, and he brought them a copy of special uh, Project Blue Book Special Report number 14. And we think, we don't know, but we think the, um, the British, at the time, the Air Ministry had a report about a 20,000 uh, uh, word report on, on UFOs that they had investigated. And uh, the, the Ministry and Heineck exchanged these two reports, and we think that, uh, I, I told Dave Clark, I think if it exists, it's in the National Archives, but it's under something that, um, it's, it may be under something like reports or briefings, and we've never looked at that. We've looked at all the UFO stuff we could find. Um, They also had a, a restricted document on Top Cliff. The restricted that is classified. Um, and Heineck brought that and some other of these items uh, back from the ministry. And he took a number of UFO cases to the ministry. But on his way over there, he stopped off at the uh, Civilian Saucer Intelligence in New York and Isabel Davis and Ted Blocher and a, a few others were there. So Heineck gave Blocher his notes and Blocher copied his notes verbatim, verbatim. And one of the cases was a UFO flying over one of the airports near Washington, D.C. And as it flew over the airport, they had what was called a ceiling light. You turn the light on, and it, it gives you the cloud height. Well, as the UFO passed over the ceiling light, um, it put out the light. So it's an electromagnetic case. And that's how... Um, that case became known during the time when the Air Force wasn't giving out any information. And the president of uh, CSI New York uh, started bugging the Air Force, and they finally admitted that the case was real. And they had a number of other cases. And that was, like I said, that's before the Project Blue Book files were, were available to anybody. So that was a that was kind of a coup. Uh, Heineck had a relationship with CSI New York starting about 55. And uh, Isabel Davis said he came to see them and they knew he was coming. So they waited. I think it was her apartment. And there's a, 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 a quiet knock on the door. And she opens the door. There's Heineck standing in one of these trench coats. He's got it pulled up around his face and everything. And he's got a pork pie hat on. So nobody could recognize him. Mysterious. <laughs> and Isabel told me, she says, what a timid little man. Because Heineck had not come out and, you know, declared for UFOs at the time. And so, uh, uh, yeah, she wasn't too impressed by that. However, they did, they did manage to get information from Heineck. Uh, before, before the Blue Book files were made available. Um, so it was, it were, were things that, 
uh, CSI could ask um, uh, the Air Force about if the cases are still unknown or if they exist or things like that. Ted Blorchett was writing the Air Force all the time about these cases that Heineck slipped the, uh, Isabel or, or uh, uh, some of the other CSI people. And so they got used to him asking about cases. So he sent them a list of cases, and they'd say, come back and say, balloon, unknown, um, aircraft, whatever. So that was like, uh, like I said, they got used to him writing, so they answered his questions. They didn't, they didn't go into any detail, but that was, that was an early, let's put it this way. It wasn't a leak, but it was an early way to get information out of the airports. Um, sometimes they would cooperate with especially skeptics. Um, and they would give them stuff that they could go in and print a magazine article about, talk about, you know, balloons or um, radar malfunctions or whatever. But uh, Locher, like I said, he, he just he wrote to the Air Force so often and so um, uh, all the time that they were more they they were. They would uh, answer his questions where they wouldn't answer anybody else's or say there's nothing to it or they actually answered his questions. Not not with much information. So uh, that was interesting. And it was interesting to know that Heineck went over there and talked to the air ministry about cases. I guess he went over there twice as far as I can figure out. It's it's hard to tell, but we have the CSI <laughs> correspondence, so that is that is one thing that we do know about fifty six he went over there. He also told them at the time that uh, Dr. Lincoln Laplace in uh, New Mexico, uh, the Air Force uh, had uh, more or less given up on him. So uh, uh, he was in, as Heineck said, he was in bad odor. Oh, we've got the the palm again. Okay, Jen, if you can, well, you can't hear me. I don't even know. Weigh in on this book. Oh, well, I I don't even know what to say. Maybe not. Okay. Anyway, I will just take this moment uh, to thank all of you for being so patient. And Jan, if you can see this. Nope, not so much. Okay. All right. Anyway, thank you so much for supporting the show, for being here, and for you know making sure that you're staying on um, well after the show is supposed to start, but clearly we were having a little challenge on our end, which has continued for the evening. Um, Jan, can you... But um, on that note, I want to thank all of my Patreons for supporting the show, and I want to thank each and every one of you for getting in there and asking such great questions. I really, I, I, like I said at the beginning of the show, I love spending Friday nights with you guys, and it's so much fun. to. It was so fun to talk to, to Jim tonight. Jan, I don't know if you can see this. Maybe we could talk about this. No. Lord, this is like some great camera work. I don't even know. Eh. Anyway, Jen has very nicely manicured hands. It's good. Um, I don't know why I just said that. Anyway, so I just want to uh, talk a little bit about while we're I'm waiting for for Jan to, um, uh, I don't know, look look at what I'm doing. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about a few years ago. I met Jan, and we were visiting Gordon Lore with Tom Tulane, and it was so much um, fun to actually sit there with Jen. I've got some great 
interviews with him and um, and high resolution wide dynamic range and highlight low light sensitivity. Yes, clearly. And I want to just thank Stock Analysis for, for your nice comments and Simon and everybody. Um, we're going to keep um, maybe Jen will turn around. I don't know. Jen, can you? Oh, Lord. Mary. Okay. Um, hang on, guys. This is good. We'll just Jen for one second. Okay. Jen, you probably can't see this, but it, oh, God. try this one more time. Uh, oh. uh, can I? Uh, 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 okay. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the sign historical uh, uh, group. Uh, Wendy Connors came up with that name. Um, it was supposed to be, you know, um, you, we had Project Sign, of course, and her thing, her thing was called the Project Project Sign uh, um, .com, but you could also interpret that as Sign of the Times. Anyways, we had a meeting in Chicago. Um, uh, oh, Doctor Dick. Oh. He's a PhD. He did a PhD in in extraterrestrial uh, beliefs. You know, he started off in the Middle Ages, and then he he took the whole um, study to you know extra beliefs in extraterrestrials through the ages. Anyways, he was supposed to be there at an astronomy conference. And he came over to the uh, to our meeting there. He was invited. I didn't think he'd ever come. He came over there and talked to us for about an hour about UFOs and felt that there really was a, a an, it was important to study UFOs in their history. Uh, and he was there, you know, he he ditched part of his meeting to come and talk to us. So that's how important he felt it was that somebody do this work. So um, Lauren, we had uh, we had uh, Jean-Jacques Vallée from uh, uh, Jean-Jacques Valesco from uh, the French Space Agency. Uh, we had uh, uh, some of the Italians there. Um, and we had, uh, Captain, uh, Dominic Weinstein, who is part of, uh, uh, uh intelligence in France, uh, anti-terrorism intelligence. So he was there. Um, and some of the usual su suspects like Jerry Clark and, um, a number of the other uh, uh, Dr. Swords. Um, so there were about 20 people there. Um, and so that was, uh, uh, and we, we talked about, we should put together a list of uh, resources that we have. And of course, uh, Eduardo Russo, he wrote about the official <laughs> Italian documents that had been released at that time. And uh, I wrote something about uh, FOIA. Um, and many people went ahead and wrote about their uh, collections, what they had in their collections. So people could look at that and see what what they had and you know what was missing and uh, there were area, areas for research. Uh, we also discussed various 
resources where people could go, like the National Archives, the Library of Congress, uh, certain other agencies. Um, and so the, uh, the foreign material was interesting as to what could be, uh, be found. Now, Valesco told us that the French Air Force and the military had released very little material. And it, it's like that till today. Some of that has come out because some of the officials in the military talk about certain cases. But uh, uh, most of the French material, if there's anything, Uh, some interviews in newspapers or other than that they do have their own UFO group but they cannot get the military to give them much material so we planned several things that we wanted to do there and one of them uh, turned out to be later on the uh, UFOs in government. Which is not just about the U.S. government, but it's about the Spanish government, the French government, uh, uh, various other entities, Australia. Uh, the Australians continue to hunt down uh, government documents in Australia. Um, if you can find it and then pay for it, they will put in Australia, they put the doc uh, declassified documents online. So that's uh, that's very helpful. I wish our, our uh, government would do that instead of 50, 100, uh, 500 people write for the same case and the, uh, the government agencies treat the, each one of those like a separate FOIA so they process them like they're separate instead of just say, hey, okay, we've been asked about this case, here it is online and nobody has to ask us about it anymore unless there's redacted material or something like that. <clears throat> but no, we do the FOIA as hard as possible here in the United States. Um, John, I don't know if you can see that. But again, this is a great... Okay. Thank you. So... I'm Erica Lukes. I'm here with Jen Aldrich, and I want to thank Jim uh, for getting into uh, the conversation tonight. It was really good to hear from from both of you, and thank you. And I want to thank everybody in, in chat. Um, Phil, good to see you, Mr. Trouble, and Scott, and Steve, and Amy, and and all of you. Um, Ken, it's just I love I love you guys. Thank you. I really I mean that from the bottom of my heart. You know, I've gone through some interesting times in the UFO world, and if it wasn't for friends like you listening to the show, if it wasn't for people like Jan, uh, Barry, and Ted Rowe, and some of the people that I have become friends with along the way, I would have given up a long time ago, but this is truly a fascinating subject. At the end of the day, are we actually going to know what this is? We probably won't, but it's the journey that that is so wonderful and makes me need a margarita. So, Jan, thank you. Thank you. Yay. Okay. So I'm going to butt in here. Yeah. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. I'm star sorry for stepping on people. Um, I hope to get them uh, resolved if we do this again. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you again. Um, and I wanted to say, you know, all of you and Peter, thank you so much for posting information about the show. And Mario, thank you for always being here and probably laughing as you see me scurry around, stepping on on 
um, things and injuring myself before the show and then all of my, my goings-ons. But Jan, um, when you get a chance to listen to this, it has been a true pleasure. And even with technical difficulties, I think it, you know that makes things more memorable. So be glad that you watched this on YouTube because it might not be available tomorrow. So anyway, I'm Erica Lukes, and I'm looking forward to having Dave Beatty on the show coming up in the next week, I'm hoping. You'll have some good information. And you can find out more about Jan and his incredible contribution to the UFO subject at project1947.com. And I look forward to uh, getting paid from Hyundai. Maybe. Maybe we can, you know work it. I don't know. Anyway, you guys, thank you so much, Troubled Minds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys take care. And I'm sure the camera will be on well after I, I stop the show because that seems to be the way I'm rolling. So you guys take care. Thank you very much. And oh, and I just want to show, um, actually, oh, I don't, I never mind. I'll show it to you next time. I don't know what I'm saying. Anyway, outro, love you guys. Peace out and goodbye.